uh, older trees were a critical backbone in pine, dry mixed conifer, and moist mixed conifer landscapes, where you have species like ponderosa pine, western larch, those fire adapted species. They're an important genetic le legacy. They have the ability to withstand a lot of mood swings of the climate over space and time, and they also are capable of withstanding fires of a uh, great variety of severities. So they're an important backbone for rebuilding the landscape. Where you don't have them, you have a high degree of intolerance to coming changes on the landscape. So it makes sense to retain what you have and make more of them. Successional patches within the moist and the dry mixed conifer forest are literally landscapes within the landscape. What we've learned is that patterns of gaps and tree clumpiness were highly influential to driving fire behavior at a patch scale. And that influenced how the larger neighborhood surrounding a patch would burn. So you can think of a patch not being homogeneous and even, but being decidedly uneven. And that clumpiness and gappiness was important for how fire and habitats would function at that fine scale. So that's sort of the third scale, right? The life form patterns matter, the patterns of serial stage conditions within the rangeland and the forest matter, and within patches, uh, clumpy and gappy patterns of vegetation matter as well. The last principle is that land ownership and land allocation patterns have disrupted natural landscape patterns. And there's a high need going forward if we're going to try to restore some of this resiliency to put our heads together, figure out how to plan together and how to do work together as a way of make, creating projects that make sense across highly mixed land lines and ownership patterns. All right. What I'd like to suggest is that we've done stand management in the U.S. and in, uh, across Canada for most of our forest management history. We were all trained in pretty much the same way, and it didn't add up to functional landscapes. In fact, we unwittingly sort of broke ways that the landscape uh, functioned. And I'd like to suggest that we have, on many of these landscapes, the opportunity to develop landscape-level prescriptions using the tools we have, but motivated by spatially allocating treatments that rebuild some of these conditions across that landscape. And what this means is for us, where we're considering doing this, to being open to a cultural change in how we do planning and how we do management, if landscape restoration is going to be important to us. And the change is literally from stepping back from stand management and not just doing stand management at really large scales and calling it landscape restoration, but actually thinking about what is the prescription for a large landscape? How do we spatially allocate treatments to, to bring back the fuel and successional conditions that support processes that we're better able to live with? And in order to do that, we need to understand what some of those patterns were like and how we've departed from those patterns, those more natural patterns of variability. And in addition to that, we need to know how the climate is going to morph those patterns going forward. So not only understanding where we've come from, but understanding where we're going. And then building a portfolio of these spatially allocated treatments to essentially create patterns on the landscape using the tools we have and that we know how to expertly apply on the landscape to create more functional patterns of habitats and of serial stage conditions and fuel beds that are going to support those processes. And then what we're going to need to do is to allow climate change as it comes down the road to us to continually modify those patterns and adapt our management as we go forward. The third part of my assignment is to talk about some tools that we've de developed in our lab and we're applying on a bunch of national forests in the Northern Rockies, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington, where folks are basically, uh, we've got our backs kind of broken with wildfire and bug outbreaks right now. And so people are eager to see whether or not they can restore some patterns. So we've been helping to develop a toolkit to take some of these principles basically and apply them to landscape level prescriptions. You want to read up on the strategy that we put together? You can find it in this document. Um, you can find them online. I'm not going to go into that.
Our strategy basically has a terrestrial landscape evaluation that we do that leads to a landscape prescription. We do an aquatic landscape evaluation where we look at roads, fish habitat connections, those kinds of things. And we develop an aquatic prescription that allows us to be able to do things that marry um, rebuilding aquatic landscapes and terrestrial landscapes in a way that's cooperative. In a nutshell, the terrestrial landscape evaluation takes the current conditions of any landscape. We usually use pretty good sized watersheds that are 20, 30,000 hectares. And a lot of times we'll take a collection of them that are adjacent, adding up to 50 or 100,000 hectares. And we ask the question using photo interpreted vegetation conditions what's the departure of the current condition from a historical range of variability and from a future range of variability and we can pick a variety of different climate scenarios for that future range variation and the analysis is basically saying where did we come from what's really changed from the way the landscape used to be and if we were to climate change adapt it how would we vary from those patterns into new patterns that are more adapted to the climate going forward? And our adaptation doesn't have to get us all the way to the 22nd century. It has to give us the stepping stones to get to the 22nd century. And the point of these evaluations is to set the context for how partners across a varied land ownership develop prescriptions in a coordinated way to to apply treatments across ownerships that work together to get this job done. The data we're using in the United States come from uh, the Interior Columbia Basin Assessment where we did photo interpretation of several hundred, about 400 watersheds. We did early and late 20th century photo interpretation twice over an area of about 7 million acres. In that assessment, we did uh, change analysis to find out by province uh, what were the key changes that were brought about by management? This is an area of about 150 million acres. And we take those watersheds that we evaluated and we post stratify them by biogeoclimatic zones that we developed. They're essentially areas, areas within one color share the same biota, they same, share the same geology, same geomorphic processes, and the same climatology. And so we expect them in terms of pattern and process to hang together as a group and be different from their other colored neighbors. The goal of our landscape evaluation is to assess the current conditions, to document the key changes in structure and composition and habitat conditions and fuel loading and fire behavior attributes and insect and disease vulnerabilities, that sort of thing. And we assess what a more typical habitat condition, networking condition would look like. And then we develop a landscape prescription that responds to that. It addresses these key departures. Choices have to be made because every single set of decisions doesn't end in a group hug. There are positive cascades and negative cascades into different kinds of dimensions you're trying to solve for, right? Everything doesn't happen in a positive direction, so choices have to be made. Am I going to grow more spotted owl habitat, or at some point in time, is that a poison pill for my wildfire problem? Well, it is in our part of the world. So choices have to be made about how much of that the landscape can support before it kicks the system in a bad direction. We develop guidance for whole watersheds for restoring them. We apply it across ownerships in a set of mutually shared prescriptions. It yields a, a portfolio of priority treatment areas, what we call a landscape prescription. And we use the tools that we already have to accomplish that. It doesn't require invention of new tools. It requires a whole concept, a whole idea for the landscape. To do it, we delineate polygons using stereo photo, pho, aerial photography, and we take dozens of different attributes, lift them off those photos. From those, we derive the structural classes, the cover types, canopy cover classes, habitat conditions, uh, fire behavior ratings, fuel loadings, insect and disease vulnerabilities, that kind of thing. We run spatial pattern metrics that essentially tell us the characteristics of those patterns, 
and they're the same ones that we use for the historical variation and the climate change variation. So we can create current condition to those reference apples to apples comparisons. And this is all done in a decision support models. So we've actually programmed a model that automates all these dimensions, all these comparisons, um, and it highlights the most significant departures. So when we're done, we have a model landscape right here that's got a breakdown of the potential vegetation groups. And in each one of those, we can take a look at the structural classes on the landscape. And we'll build a dashboard that allows us to be able to use um, a suite of metrics to determine what's departed from the historical conditions, what's departed from the climate change adaptation conditions, what's departed from both, and we use those evaluations to essentially get a short list of things that if we really wanted to restore functionality, we could apply it. We'll do this to the cover type conditions, we'll do it to fuel loading and fire behavior conditions, so we're really asking the question in that landscape, how would fire normally behave when it's not out of whack? What, the, what would the habitat configurations look like? This example is northern spotted owl, but we do Canadian lynx, we do marten and fisher and all sorts of things. So we can use emblematic species that are sort of keystone for the landscape or a special group of species that's really important to track. We look at about two dozen different native pathogens and insects to find out just how did they, how vulnerable was a typical landscape uh, historically and how did that vary. And we, we can develop patch size distributions for each one of these dimensions so we can actually figure out how to make bigger patches of the right stuff and break up uh, patches of the uh, stuff that's way too big and, and pattern them. And that leads to a landscape diagnosis which has a number of dimensions and the landscape prescription puts together the portfolio of treatments, applies them to the right places on the landscape. And then we can use uh, additional patch scale features, like we can uh, calculate um, the difference between predicted uh, evapotranspiration and actual evapotranspiration and, and see what sorts of water deficits we can expect under different climate scenarios. So we can actually say, if we're gonna have less forest area, where should we let forest go and not try to force it back on the landscape where we're literally not going to have the productivity environment that we want. We can model fire flow on the landscape and ask the question, what are the places that are sending fire downstream to the most places? And we can treat them to change the contagion and fire spread on the landscape. We can use water deficit locations and topographic positions to more suitably site habitats on the landscape. Our spotted owl habitats are an artifact of fire exclusion. They're in all the wrong places and they're unsupportable in the long run. So, but we can actually relocate them on the landscapes where they're supportable with the fire regime. It allows us to be able to tailor treatments using tools we have to the landscape and then in the decision support model, we can actually say, when I apply those treatments to the landscape, how did I make headway in climate change adapting my landscape from its current condition to one that I want to send it forward on in the future? We use uh, some of Derek Churchill and Andrew Larson's work to go into our even homogeneous stands and rebuild some of these clumpy, gappy distributions that are going to influence patch scale fire behavior and how insects work in those. And uh, we have a variety of different distributions that we can use to apply uh, silvicultural standards to those uh, stands and basically recreate the clump and gap distributions. If you're interested, uh, those results are published in this paper. So you can look under the hood for how we came to our conclusions. This is a published implementation guide for this uh, individual clump and opening um, method that uh, Larson and Churchill have put together. You can also find that online and download it. And this paper gives you uh, a detailed look under the hood of how we run the landscape evaluations, how we do the work. If you want to look over our shoulder and see how we're thinking about the problem, how we're breaking it down for some of our landscapes, you can read about it in that paper.